Pastor Jason comes to continue our series, People of His Presence. Hey, good morning. We're so excited that you're here. Would you help me welcome those who are watching us online as well? We know many get to watch online every week, and we're thankful for that. My name is Jason, and my wife Robin's sitting right over here. We're going to be in the Welcome Center right after this worship experience. We'd love to say hi, especially if you're our guest. We'd love to get to know you a little bit better, so take just a moment and stop by. Before I get the message, let me quickly just say thank you so much. Last week, we took up our Not About Us offering for the month of March, once a month, each uh, month this year. This is our 100th year of existence as a church. So once a month, we're taking up an offering to bless a different church, not our church, a church that is not about us or not from us. And so last week, it was for Bethel, Alaska. Our missions team will be heading there this summer. And last week, you gave over $8,500 to help that project. And I just want to say thank you so much for your generosity and for supporting that project. What we did is we immediately turned around and we wrote a check for $30,000. And you say, well, that's new math. How does that work out? Well, here's how that works out. You're generous, you're faithful in your giving and of your t- in your tithe and your offering. And so as a church, we tithe. So when you tithe, we turn around and tithe off of the tithe we receive back into missions and back into outreach. And so you're so generous in your tithe that we were able to add money to the $8,500 to make it 30,000. The money's already should be in Alaska now, and they're waiting for the river to thaw so that they can load the materials on the container and float it down the river to Bethel. How many are grateful that we're not waiting for rivers to thaw in Oklahoma? Okay. Woo! I mean, I love Alaska, but I love it in the summertime not in the winter time, right? And then let me just really quickly, this morning is the beginning of what we are calling Compassion Week. It's often in religious circles referred to as Holy Week or Passion Week. We're calling it Compassion Week. And so there's three components I want you to know about. Number one, there's bags of groceries. There were 700 bags of groceries when we started the day. And the eight o'clock service, if I'm being honest, they just didn't do their job. So there's about 698 bags of groceries still out there right now. I need everybody to take groceries with you this morning. Here's how you can use it. If you need it, awesome. Use it for your family. If you've got a neighbor, a coworker, a relative, a friend that can use it, awesome. We're all about sharing the love, joy, and peace of Jesus Christ with the least, last, and lost. We're empowering and equipping you to do this. The team showed up yesterday and filled those bags. We need you to get them out of the commons and give them out to people. Each bag has an Easter invitation stapled to it. So if you, whoever you give the bag to doesn't have a home church already, there's an invitation to Easter. As you heard Melanie say on the video, four experiences this year, Saturday night service, dinner at five o'clock, and then the, the worship experience will begin at six. And then Sunday, our normal times, 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m., and 11 a.m. And then again, on April 7th, so two weeks from today, the Sunday after Easter, is not only Baptism Sunday, but the worship team from ORU is going to be back with us again this year. They came last year and did an amazing job, and so they're coming back on Sunday, April the 7th, and we want you to be a part of that. Lastly, before I dive into the heart of the message, today is Palm Sunday, and that's a very important day on our calendar. I want to take just a second and explain what Palm Sunday is about. If you have your phone or your Bible, Mark chapter 11 is probably one of the most succinct kind of explanations of Palm Sunday for us. And I'm just going to read verse 1. It's not on the screen, but I'm going to read Mark 11, verses 1 through 3. Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, and Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go to the village over there, he told them, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie the donkey and bring it here. And if anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs it, and he will return it soon. And then here's the part that's on the screen for you this morning. Mark chapter 11, verse 7, here's what happened. They brought the colt to Jesus. They threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. 
Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting. And here's your chance. Why don't you shout with me this morning as we read these words? Praise God. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God in the highest heaven. And so it was Jesus' triumphal entry when he came into the city of Jerusalem. And what Palm Sunday does is it reminds us of a couple of different things. First, it reminds us that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem knowing that he was going to die. That his suffering, his passion, if you will, was about to take place. So we kind of set our minds or our attention on that. And, And speaking of that, on Good Friday, this coming Friday, from 1130 to 130, it'll be come and go. There'll be communion set up here in the worship center, worship music playing. If you want to come and just have a pause in that day to reflect on what Jesus did, that would be so appropriate. I'll be here. I'd love to pray with you. If if you'd like prayer, I'd love to help you as you receive communion. We're just taking a moment to reflect on what Jesus has done for us. And that's kind of what Palm Sunday leads us into. But second, just as the people welcome Jesus into the city in Jerusalem, Palm Sunday reminds us to welcome Jesus into our hearts. That we should be open to receiving the King, the Messiah who has come. But third, it reminds us that Jesus not only came the first time from heaven to earth, he not only came to Jerusalem, he is coming again. And he's coming looking for a people who are ready for his return, which means that we have to be busy doing the job that he has assigned to us, sharing his love, joy, and peace, making disciples of all the nations. And so that's what we're going to do this morning as we start. Would you, if you're able, would you stand with me across this building? We're going we're gonna to start by just doing what the Bible said. We're just going to say, praise God, glory to God in the highest heavens. If you want to lift your hands right now, that's certainly appropriate. But let's just all express praise to Jesus and thank him that he came. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you came. You came from heaven to earth as you approached the city of Jerusalem. You came into that city knowing how that week would unfold. You knew, God, what was ahead of you. In fact, you you told your father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will. I want your will to be done. And we know because your word says it, because you've promised us, you are coming back again soon. So we pray that when you come back, you will not only find us saying that we're ready, but you will find a people who are truly ready for you to return, who are actively sharing our faith, who are who are looking for those who are far from God and telling them to prepare their hearts for your return. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stay standing if you would. I want to take you to our In the Vault text this morning. This series has been called People of His Presence, and we've talked about people in the Bible who have encountered the presence of God, the importance of us experiencing God's presence, and then we've tried to just pause and create space for the Holy Spirit to impact us, and that's what our In the Vault text talks about. Would you say it with me this morning? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. God bless you as you're seated. You know, throughout this teaching, we have been reminding ourselves that God wants to manifest himself to his people. He wants you to know him. You can talk to him and relate to him. He is a personable God. You can hear him. You can feel him. You can sense him. And and we studied people in the Bible who have had these encounters like Moses and Samuel and Samson and David and Pastor Daniel last week talked to us about Jesus and the veil was torn in the temple and now we can encounter the presence of God but today we have to go one step further in that process and I want to look at the Holy Spirit and one of the things that Robin and I love the most about pastoring Spirit Church is we are such a diverse church Don't raise your hand, don't identify yourself in any way, but some of you were raised in a Presbyterian tradition, some of you grew up Methodist or Baptist or Catholic or Nazarene or Wesleyan or Assemblies of God, which is what our church is. Some of you grew up with no church background whatsoever. And so when I say we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, people think, I hope he prays soon so I can leave. Because there's all this uncomfortability around the Holy Spirit. And hear me when I say this, Satan wants you to be uncomfortable with the concept of the Holy Spirit. The reason for that is because if you're uncomfortable with the Holy Spirit, you'll avoid the Holy Spirit altogether. And that's Satan's goal, is that we'd avoid the Holy Spirit. So this morning, we're gonna tear down those walls, and rather than being antsy about the Holy Spirit, we're just gonna be biblical. Is that okay if we, as a church, as Christians, are just biblical, and we just look at what the Bible teaches 
about the Holy Spirit. Here's one thing that we know from the Bible is that the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit's not a force or a power or an enigma that we don't know. He's God. He's personable. The second thing we know about the Holy Spirit is that his presence and his activity in our lives are gifts that enable us to know God more fully, to live like Jesus, and to share his love, joy, and peace as we're commanded to do. In fact, Jesus talked about this in Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, in verse number 13, Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We shouldn't be afraid or nervous about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is a gift to us. And when you think about the Holy Spirit, especially in relation to God's presence at work in and through us, here's the truth. When Jesus came to this earth, he brought God's presence to us. But when Jesus left this earth, he sent the Holy Spirit as God's presence in us. Isn't that powerful that God's presence now resides in us? In fact, we read about that in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 22, where we find out that it's through the Holy Spirit that God's presence actually resides in us. Jesus has died on the cross. He was in the tomb. He's resurrected from the dead. He appears to his believers, some of them, and they're like, can it possibly be? Is it really him? And so then he shows up on a Sunday night to make himself real to them. It says that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about those words there in just a second, receive the Holy Spirit. But isn't it powerful that before Jesus talked to them about the Holy Spirit, he said to them not once but twice, peace. See, Satan wants us to be chaotic and wacky and confusing and scary when we talk about the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants us to experience peace when we talk about the Holy Spirit. I hope that puts your mind at ease today. I know it does for me. And then it says he breathed on them and told them, receive the Holy Spirit. What Jesus was saying in that moment is that I'm not going to be with you physically any longer but my presence, the power, the Holy Spirit is going to be inside of you from this point on. So if you're in this room this morning and you have said yes to Jesus, if he's the Lord and Savior of your life, the Holy Spirit is living inside of you. And if he's living inside of you, then your very next step is you should seek to be baptized in water. It's what Jesus did. He was baptized in water. We follow his example. And so I would encourage you, it's funny, sometimes people get nervous. I've been a Christian for 25 years and I've never been water baptized. Well, we're baptizing people April 7th. Get baptized on April 7th. What are people going to think? They're going to think that you're following Jesus. They're going to think that you're a new creation in Christ. That's what they're going to think. They're going to clap and celebrate. They're also going to think that you're really wet when you come up out of the water. It's no big deal. We're just following Jesus. Jesus. It's a public proclamation of the change that has taken place in us. So if Jesus is inside of you, he's living in your heart, the Holy Spirit isn't living in you, you should seek to be water baptized. But the Bible shows us that there is a second baptism available to those who have accepted Christ as Savior and Lord, and we call that spirit baptism, or you might say it baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now let's talk about this for just a second. In the Old Testament, baptism in the Holy Spirit was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 44, in Joel chapter 2, and in other instances. Then when we get to the New Testament, we meet John the Baptist. This is Jesus' cousin. He was born just a few months before Jesus. And here's what John the Baptist said in Matthew chapter 3. I'm baptizing with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I am so much greater that I'm not worthy even to be his slave and to carry his sandals. And then John says of Jesus, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So then Jesus is there with his disciples, again, speaking to them after he has been uh, crucified on the cross, after he has risen from the dead, and he tells his disciples, now I'm going to send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised, but... Wait in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you 
with power from heaven. So the Holy Spirit's prophesied about in the Old Testament, promised by John the Baptist, promised again by Jesus, and then we go to Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit comes and baptizes believers on that day. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. On the day of Pentecost. Pentecost is a scary word, which means 50 days after Passover. Ooh. It's a freaky word, but we throw it around and it has all these other connotations. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. It filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. And when you see that word there, languages, that word languages can also be translated the word tongues. And this is where a lot of people get hung up or confused about the Holy Spirit and especially about the issue of speaking in tongues. Now, again, we're in Assemblies of God Church and based on what we read in Acts chapter 2 and what we see in other New Testament passages and teachings, we believe in speaking in tongues. In fact, we refer to it as the initial physical evidence of of spirit baptism and I would encourage every single person under the sound of my voice every Christian to, to not only be baptized in water but to seek to be baptized in the Holy Spirit but let me give you a word as I tell you that I can't find a single person in the Bible who prayed that they would speak in tongues it's two services in a row nobody said amen when I've said that nobody's even gone mmm or that's right. I can't find a single reference in the Bible where somebody prayed, Lord, help me speak in tongues. But I can find all throughout the Bible where people prayed, Lord, we want to be people of your presence. We want more of you. Lord, you told us, you promised that the Holy Spirit would clothe us from, with power from on high. Lord, you told us to not live the city, leave the city until we received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So God, whatever you want to do and in however you want to do it, we are open to your moving and to your manifestation in our lives. Does that make sense? We just say, Lord, I want more of you. I want to be a person of your presence. In Acts chapter 2, they weren't waiting to speak in tongues. They were waiting for the promise of the Father. They had no idea what was going to happen next. They just knew that Jesus made a promise. And how many believe that when Jesus makes a promise, you can take it to the bank? You can depend on. He's a promise-keeping God. And so as people of his presence, that should be our goal. Is, Lord, I want all that you have for me, however that looks, whatever that looks like. I want to recognize that your presence is living inside of me, that you're working in and through me in any way that you desire. Because here's the reality. When God's presence is living in us, we operate on a totally different level. Not a lesser, not a worse level, but a better level, a better level than we ever could. And I'm, I want to show you this this morning, biblically, simply through the life of Peter. You might remember Peter. He was one of the disciples of Jesus. In fact, he was one of the three closest. We talk about Peter, James, and John all the time. But then, like some of us in the room, and don't, don't call yourself out, Peter failed. He messed up. In the most vulnerable moment of Jesus' life, Peter denies Christ not once, not twice, but three times in a row. He denies that he knows Jesus, that he was associated with Jesus, that he was one of the disciples. And then a month and a half later, this happens. About 50 days later, 50 days after Passover, when Jesus was betrayed, is this moment here. And the Holy Spirit is poured out in powerful ways. And so I want to examine what Peter was like before he encountered the presence of God and after he experienced the presence of God. And let's look at the difference in his life. Here, I'm going to give you five simple words. When we allow God's presence to work in us, here's what we experience. Number one, it's transformation. The first thing that we experience when we allow God's presence to work in our lives is we experience transformation. I'm going to take you to Luke chapter 22, but most of this morning we're going to be in Acts 2, 3, 4, and 5. But let's start at Luke chapter 22. And in this scene, we see Peter, while Jesus has been arrested and he is being tried by the Roman officials and by the religious leaders, the guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and they sat around it and Peter joined them there. And a servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began scare, staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers. And Peter denied it. Woman, I don't even know him. Denial number one. Then we keep going in this story. Let's go to the, the next verse. 
verse 58. After a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. No, man, I'm not, Peter retorted. Denial number two. About an hour later, someone else insisted, this must be one of them. I lost it. This must be one of them because he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you are talking about. Denial number three. And immediately the rooster crowed because Jesus had told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before I die. And there we see the fulfillment of that. I don't know if you've ever had a terrible, no good, very bad day as a Christian. This is it. This is it. But then what happens? Well, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 happens. The day of Pentecost comes. The Holy Spirit is poured out. And those people who were gathered in the upper room, again, not knowing what was going to happen, they begin to praise God in languages they previously did not know. And as they did, there were people in Jerusalem who were gathered for a festival. And they had come from different regions, different tribes, different areas. And they were hearing these people not speaking in their original languages, but speaking in languages and dialects from the places they came from. <laughs> this is ridiculous. This is crazy. This is absurd. In fact, they began mocking them and said, these people are drunk. What is going on? These are psychos up there in that room. We ought to do something about it. And those who were gathered in the upper room, about 120 of them are saying, well, somebody needs to step out there and address the room. Now, if you're in the room, would Peter have been your first choice? Because he sure wouldn't have been mine. If they would have said, who ought to speak for us? What about Peter? Um, no, no, and no. Because he just denied Jesus one, two, and three times. I ain't picking him. Who knows what this guy's going to do if we get him out there? You know what I'm saying? He's going to say, oh, they're just hopped up on Mountain Dew. You know, like we can't send Peter out there. But look at what the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward. I know those seem like just really simple words in the Bible, but think about what we just read about Peter, who three times, the first of which was to a little girl, that he denied Jesus. He's the one who steps forward and shouts to the crowd, not says, if I could get your attention for a second, I'd just like to let you know. He shouts to the crowd, listen carefully, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. What you are seeing is what was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. How does this happen? Because transformation occurs when we encounter the presence of God in our lives. The second thing that occurs when we encounter God's presence and experience it is boldness. Because here's Peter, not just the one who is stepping up and preaching, he's preaching boldly about Christ. He's explaining what has taken place. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. Peter's explaining to the people, God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are witnesses to this. Now, for you and I, God raised Jesus from the dead, it's like, that's old news. We've known about that. But this is like 50 days later after this has happened, and he's saying, guys, Jesus is alive. Okay, thank you. One amen that Jesus is alive. It says, he's alive and we've witnessed it. He is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out on us just as you see and hear today. He's not hiding behind what happened. He's not ashamed of what's taking place. He's saying this is from God. God is true to his word. Look at verse number 40 and 41 of Acts chapter 2. Peter continued preaching for a long time. See, right there, it's biblical that I can preach long. It's right there. Take a picture of the screen. Okay. He preached for a long time, urging all his... By the way, there's one other time in the New Testament when they preach and a dude fell out of a window and died. So, but then they raised him from the dead, so beside the point. Preaching from a long time, in urging the listeners, save yourself from this crooked generation. And those who believe what Peter said were baptized and outed to the church that day. Look how many. About 3,000 in all. 3,000 people got saved when the guy who was scared of a little girl around a fire encountered the presence of God in a powerful way. Transformation and boldness. And now the guy who was hiding, not once, not twice, but three times saying, I don't know who he is, is now the one who's saying, this is God. This is God, and you need to know him and experience him in your life, and 3,000 people get saved. 
So when we allow God's presence to work, we experience transformation, we experience boldness. But I want to take you to Acts chapter 3 because then we begin to experience provision from heaven that we otherwise wouldn't experience. So he, he preaches on the day of Pentecost telling them this is God. 3,000 people believe. And then the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 3 that Peter and John go to the temple uh, on the Lord's day when it's time to worship. And when they go to worship, there is a man sitting outside the temple who has been carried there on a mat. He's been carried there on a mat literally like every day of his life. The Bible says he has been lame since birth. And he sits outside the temple gates and he begs people to give him money because he has no other way to resource or to provide for himself. Honestly, he has nothing else to do. He can't walk, he can't move, he can't function on his own. People carry him and leave him there. And here come Peter and John, and he begins to think, they're approaching me, they're looking at me, maybe they're going to give me money. And so Peter and John walk up to him, and they look at him, and Peter says, hey, look at us. Not in like the arrogant way of look at us, but hey, I need you to take note of what's about to happen here. And the lame man looked at them thinking he was going to get some money. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. I'll give you what God has given me. I'll give you what this Holy Spirit has made available as I have been in his presence. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. I'm going to give you something better than a material possession. I'm going to restore to you what was taken from you by sickness. And then in Acts chapter 3 verse 7, just to, to prove that it happened, Peter took the lame man by the right hand and he helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and his ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. And this man who that morning was carried to the temple, that, this man who was lame from birth, jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. And then walking and leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Why did this happen? Because Peter encountered the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life, and he says, I, of myself, I have nothing to offer you, but in the name of Jesus Christ, you can experience freedom and healing and wholeness and provision again and by the way if God does that to you you are free to run back and forth the whole time while I'm preaching you can jump and dance and shout because the God who did it in Acts chapter 3 is the Jesus who's still doing it today and the way that he's doing it is for people encountering the presence of the Holy Spirit that transformation occurs that boldness takes place. because here's here's spirit boldness you gotta, I mean, you got to have some boldness to step up and say, hey, look at me. I don't have money, but I've been with the Lord. I don't have anything in my pocket to offer you, but I've had an encounter with God's presence. Rise up and walk. There's provision that comes when we encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me take you to Acts chapter 4 and show you the fourth thing that happens when we allow God's presence to work in us. We experience determination. And I like to call it maybe a, a spirit-led, spirit-directed determination where we would want to quit. The Holy Spirit doesn't allow us to quit. Because Peter, this man gets healed. He's jumping and leaping and shouting. And people are like, isn't this the lame dude that was outside? And Peter's like, well, I'm glad you asked. Everybody open your Bible real quick. I'd like to take a moment to begin preaching. He begins preaching right there in the temple. We call that a power encounter where somebody is healed and then we immediately follow up with an explanation of this could only happen by God's mighty hand. We've got one in our midst. Jim Schultz is sitting right back here and about a month and a half ago he went to Mozambique to visit his kids in Africa and he got extremely sick while he was there. And let's just be honest, we didn't know what was going to happen. But we sure do know that the Lord was with him, and the Lord touched his body and healed him, and he's back in church today. And as I talked to Jim and Lorreen before service this morning, they want God to receive the glory for what happened in this healing. So he's preaching. The religious leaders say, Peter, you got to quit preaching. And Peter says, hold my root beer, because I'm not going to quit preaching. I'm not going to stop. So in Acts chapter 4 and verse 3, they arrest him. This is what the Bible says. They arrested him, and since they, uh, it was already evening, they put him in jail until the morning. But by that point, many of the people who had heard the message and they believed it, so the number of men who now believed had totaled 5,000. Where did he start? Around a fire, ashamed of Jesus. Denying him, not once, not coincidentally. Three unique times denying Jesus. He's now imprisoned because he won't quit preaching about Jesus, but the result is that 5,000 people have said yes to Jesus. 
So they're in prison. The council is trying to decide what are they going to do to stop Peter and John? How are they going to get them to quit preaching in the name of Jesus? But they are so determined, Peter and John are, that they're not going to quit. We're going to honor, serve. We're going to proclaim Jesus. Verse 13 of Acts chapter 4, the the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures, and they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. I'm just telling you right now, I hope when people see me, they recognize someone who has been with Jesus because it makes all the difference when you've been with Jesus. So look at verse 18. How does this finish up right here? They called the apostles back in and they commanded them to never again speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think that God wants us to obey you rather than him? Look at this line. We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. When you've encountered and experienced God's presence, there is a newfound determination And if I'm being totally transparent with you this morning, those of you in this room, and you know who you are because you're some of my closest friends, but those of you who serve at VOM and you see this firsthand, I read the magazines, but you know the people. And to hear their testimonies of how they've lost their loved ones, they've been, their houses burned down, they've had to give up everything for the call of Christ, yet they say these words, we can't stop telling what we've seen and heard. God bless the persecuted church. God, be with our brothers and sisters who are daily persecuted for their faith. God, empower and encourage them with your presence, we pray. Here's the last thing. When we allow God's presence to work in us, we experience deliverance. So they've been arrested, Peter and John have. They've been flogged, which means they've been beaten on their back. They've been released, but when they're released, they're not like, I'm glad that's over. Let's go hide somewhere. No, they start a prayer meeting and they say, hey, guess what? They told us to be quiet and stop preaching about Jesus. So we need everybody to pray that God would give us more courage and more boldness to keep preaching about Jesus. Pray with us that the Holy Spirit would empower us to keep being faithful to the presentation of the word. They pray this prayer and God shows up. And I mean, there are miracles. More people are getting saved. Demons are being delivered from people. The Bible even tells us this is wild. They're walking by people and their shadow, just their shadow would would go across someone and that person would be healed just by their shadow. They would give handkerchiefs and aprons and they would just let the disciples touch them and then they would take those handkerchiefs and put them on a sick person and the sick person would be healed. I mean, these dramatic manifestations of God's power. Well, guess who gets mad about this? The religious people. The religious people are upset, so they arrest them again. We told you to quit preaching. Peter and John say, look, we're going to obey God. We're going to obey God's authority rather than your authority. So the leaders close the doors and they say, you know what? We're going to kill them. We are going to shut them up one way or another. We're going to kill them. And a man in that meeting named Gamaliel, he was one of the religious leaders. He says, hey, um, hang on just a second. Hear me out on this. A couple of years ago, We had an incident like this where this guy claimed he was a Messiah. He got a bunch of people to start following him out in the wilderness somewhere. You remember that? And then all of a sudden it just kind of fizzled out into nothing. And then a few years after that, there was another guy. He started a rebellion. He was going to overthrow the government. He was going to do things the right way and bring God's kingdom. You remember what happened to that? It came to nothing. And then Gamaliel says these wise wise words in Acts chapter 5 verses 38 and 39. I I love this. I want to show this to you. My advice is this. Leave these men alone. Let them go. If they're planning on doing these things merely on their own, it will soon be overthrown. But if this is from God, you're not going to be able to overthrow them. You may only find yourselves fighting against God. It happened because they encountered the real presence of God. It changed everything about them. So Gamaliel says these words in Acts chapter 5, verse 40. The other religious leaders accept his advice. So they called the apostles in. They had them flogged, beaten. And they ordered them to never again speak in the name of Jesus. And they let them go. And this is the one that just gets me. Because they leave the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace 
for the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you so much that you considered us worthy enough to be beaten on our backs like you were. Lord, thank you so much that we could be persecuted in the same manner that you were. And then it says these words, and every day. If that was like a nursery rhyme or a fairy tale, we could gloss over those words. But these are guys who have been arrested and who have been beaten for declaring that Jesus is the Messiah. And they didn't wait for things to calm down. They didn't go to another city. They didn't say we're only gonna do it on Tuesdays at you know three in the morning when nobody's watching. Every day in the temple and from house to house, they continue to preach and teach this one simple message. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is who he says he is. He can do what he said he can do. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this all happens because they allowed the presence of God to work in their lives. It all started in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And I wonder what would happen if we didn't pray that we would speak in tongues. If we didn't pray that we'd have any kind of manifestation like that. If we just prayed, Lord, I want to be a person of your presence, however that looks. If it means I speak in tongues, I'm open to speaking in tongues. If it means that you raise up a new level of boldness and righteousness, I'm open to that. Lord, I'm open to however you want to use me. It's promised in the Bible that I'm going to be clothed with power from on high, that I'm going to be baptized in your spirit, and I want to receive all that you have from me. Remember what Jesus said when he told them they were going to receive the Holy Spirit. Peace. It's peace. It's not chaos. It's not wacky. It's not weird. It's peace. So we're going to do what we've been doing. Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. This morning, I'm going to invite you, if you're able, to stand. In just a second, Jackson and Jenny are just going to sing a simple song. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Let's just start by being still in his presence. Let's just start by saying, Lord, I want to be a person of your presence. I want everything that you have for me whatever way that looks. If that's your confession, if, that your, if that's your prayer, would you just begin to verbalize that in your own way right where you're seated? If you want to lift your hands, you're certainly, that's very appropriate to do in this moment. If you want to just turn your total focus on him, just kind of tune me out for a second. But let's just pray together. Lord, we welcome your presence. We want everything that you have for us. Lord, you said you've promised that you would clothe us with power from on high, that you would use us to bring your glory. Jesus, you said the Father had sent you and now you are sending us. You said that the Holy Spirit would go before us, but he would also live inside of us. We thank you for that. So we welcome you in this place, Holy Spirit. Come on, let's sing these words out together. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood me place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Come on, can you sing that one more time? Holy Spirit. about receiving and experiencing all that God has for us, that begins by saying yes to Jesus. If you haven't said yes to Jesus, if you haven't welcomed Him into your heart as Savior and Lord, you're missing out. You're, you're living apart from Him. But once we have said yes to Jesus, we're opening the door to all of His blessings, all of His favor. It doesn't mean we're not going to suffer. It doesn't mean we're not going to maybe be arrested or be persecuted or be beaten. But it means that God is faithful and that Jesus is with us. And He will empower us and give us the strength and encouragement that we need when we go through it.
I have no intention of embarrassing you in any way, but I simply would like to pray for you if you'd like to say yes to Jesus. In fact, I'm going to lead all of us in a prayer in just a moment. But if you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, would you just slip up your hand right now, maybe make eye contact with me and say, hey, Pastor Jay, pray for me. I want to say yes to Jesus today. Maybe you're distant, maybe you're far from God, and you're saying, man, I I need to make some things right between God and myself. Yeah, just slip up the hand and say, hey, pray with me. If you're watching us online and you're wanting to participate, just put the word yes in your chat box. Let us know that you're saying yes to Jesus. I've seen some folks who have lifted hands this morning. I thank you for your courage in doing that. I'm sure we probably had some that have even said yes. What the Bible tells us, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So those of you that lifted your hand this morning, you declared, I believe. But now there's the confession part. It's just a simple prayer, a prayer acknowledging that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And I want to lead all of us, just so that it's not awkward, in praying this prayer together. So would you join me all across this room and those of you watching online. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I'm sorry that I have sinned and lived a life that was not pleasing to you. Today I receive you as my Savior and Lord. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and make me more like you. And I will do my best to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, if you prayed that prayer this morning, you are a new creation in Christ. Your old life, your old way of thinking and living and behaving, it's done. God's doing a new thing in you. Yeah. We want to help you be baptized in water. That's happening on April 7th. We want to encourage you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That can happen at any point. Because here's the great thing about the Holy Spirit. God's presence is not confined to this building. His presence now lives inside of us. It's with us wherever we go. I know you might be hurrying to get out. Can we take just another second? Can you sing another chorus of that again? Come on, let's worship Him one more time. Thank you for your presence in this place and in our hearts, Lord. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here, Lord. You're welcome in my life. Welcome, Jesus. Fill the atmosphere. God, we want your glory. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for to be. special morning it's been. Um, again, thank you so much for being here, for spending your Sunday with us at Spirit Church. I do want to remind you before you go, those grocery bags uh, in the commons, they're for you to take. Uh, if you are in need of some groceries, we'd love for this to be a blessing from Spirit Church to you. Feel free to take one of those. If you know someone that may be in need, they can choose a bag of groceries. Uh, feel free, please, please take them. Take them to uh, give them out. This is the way that we can share that love, joy, and peace of Jesus again as part of this compassion week. So please take those because uh, we'd much rather that you have them than they'd be sitting in our comments doing nothing. We want people to be blessed. So make sure you take those. Before we go, I want to pray a prayer of blessing over you. So if you feel comfortable, raise your hands this morning. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. We love you guys. Have a wonderful week. We will see you on Easter.